Hi there, Smart Drivers, talking today about social driving, the problems that lead to car crashes. And if you participate in social driving when preparing for a driver's test, unfortunately, you're not going to be successful. That's what we're gonna give you information about today. I am a good driver. Most drivers are going to agree with that statement and most drivers are going to be thinking that it is not me that needs to change. It's not me that needs to improve my driving skills. It's the other driver. They're the ones that are the problem. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. My mom, whom I love dearly, uh, you know, every time I talk to her about traffic and the problems of other traffic, she talks about people and brakes and people come screaming up to the intersection and slam on their brakes and <laughs> thinking that the brakes are going to fail on their vehicles, but people do it all the time. And again, that is in combination with people following too close when they're driving. So this is what we're talking about in terms of social driving, being a social activity, and you have to get along with other people. But how do you do that? How do you keep space? Because everything in the driving environment is telling you to do something different. But if you do that, if you participate in what other people are doing on the roadway, when you go for a driver's test, you will not be successful. As well, if you participate in social driving and you're hoping on a wing and a prayer that you were going to react fast enough when somebody else does something goofy, you're probably not. It's probably going to be a matter of time before you get into trouble. Okay, social driving, it's the one thing, it's, it's the belief that I'm a good driver, it's the one thing that unites us as a race, regardless of creed, religion, politics, race, <laughs> most people are going to believe and stick with the saying that I am a good driver. Unfortunately, we are all going to make mistakes when we're driving. All right, so social driving is the problems associated with social driving. It's the way that everybody drives after they get their license. Drivers are reactionary and retaliatory. They follow too close. Drivers stop too close in traffic and they stop too or they drive too close, not stop, but drive too close to other road users. So minimum safe distance of two to three seconds behind other vehicles, stopping in traffic one vehicle length back. Several reasons why you stop one vehicle length back. First and foremost, it is defensive posturing against being rear-ended at a traffic light when you're stopped. If you're sitting there and there's no traffic behind you, you can watch and monitor the center mirror and look at the vehicles coming up behind you. And if the vehicles are coming up behind you, then you can move forward, pump your brakes and flash the brake lights a couple of times. And oftentimes that's enough to get yourself to get the vehicle behind you to stop. As well, if you change your mind or the vehicle in front of you breaks down, you can drive out and around it without backing up. And then if the vehicle in front of you rolls backwards, it's not gonna roll into you. And then finally, in an ideal world in which I live of uh, congestion, if everybody stayed back one vehicle length, the whole pack of vehicles at the intersection could move off together at the same time and we would reduce congestion and then three feet one meter minimum between your vehicle and vulnerable road users and i told you this story a couple of weeks ago i was walking striker and the student driver turned left from the side street just in the proximity where i was walking and i actually stepped back up on the grass because the the driver the young driver actually was too close to me <laughs> closer than three feet and i did not feel comfortable at all and the driving instructor should have used that as a teaching moment to say, hey, you needed to be in the other lane. The road was completely clear. There were no other vehicles. There was no reason that you needed to be that close to a pedestrian or a cyclist or another vulnerable road user. Poor communication when we're driving. It's exactly what Cheryl was saying about driving in the Carolinas and that people fail to signal. And we'll talk more about signaling here. All right, almost everyone follows too close, and when traffic slows down, people are even closer. When they're in congestion, bumper to bumper traffic, people are too close to the vehicle in front of them. Oftentimes what happens is they get distracted, and when they get distracted, they bump the vehicle in front of them and rear end the vehicle in front of them. If you get out on the freeway and one vehicle slows down and the vehicles behind are too close, instead of taking their foot off the throttle, they have to brake and then the vehicle behind them has to brake. And by the time you get to vehicle number 10 in the line of cars, because they're all too close and everybody's braking, by the time you get to the 10th vehicle, the entire pack of vehicles has come to a stop. 
All right, two close and cues, getting rear-ended, bilateral control, that control in front and behind your vehicle. And you can type that into Google, look up bilateral control, and you will also find phantom traffic jams when you're driving. Misperceptions about driving and traffic. And of course, uh, space, It was. it's interesting because I always get Indians coming on and leaving comments about you will never survive a day in India with using these kinds of techniques in driving. And the reality is, you know, I know that there is a lot of congestion in Delhi and other cities in India. The reality is, is they're not surviving now. They have one of the higher crash rates in the world in terms of traffic deaths per 100,000 kilometers. So when they come and tell me that this won't work, well, what they're doing now is not working. So how do you change it? How do you make that transition? So if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. And we were talking about this morning with motorcycles, uh, scooters, e-scooters, and uh, you know, the three-wheeled vehicles that they have in India. I'm not sure what the name is. Somebody might be able to tell me what the name of those vehicles is. I know it has a name. Uh, you know, how do you deal with that mix of traffic and everybody disobeying any sort of road infrastructure rules that might be in place? Okay, drivers fail to communicate. We talked about this with Cheryl in terms of signaling. Most drivers don't signal. That is not the number one way that other drivers and road users communicate on the roadway. Their actions communicate intent. If a vehicle is in the left turning lane, high probability that that vehicle is going to turn left. If a road user is, if a pedestrian is at the crosswalk, there's a high probability that that pedestrian is going to cross the roadway. If a vehicle is slowing down in relation to an intersection and they are moving to one side or the other of their lane, it indicates that they are going to turn left or right at that intersection. This is what their actions indicate to you. So you need to move to a higher level of interpreting traffic patterns and understanding the actions of individual road users when you're driving. All right, uh, reactionary and retaliatory. Drivers do this when they're driving, they're reactionary, they're too close, they're hoping on a wing and a prayer that they get their vehicle stopped in time so they don't crash into the vehicle in front of them. They're retaliatory. If somebody is tailgating you, oftentimes what happens is you slow down to tell them that they're too close and then they follow you even closer to tell you that you are going too slow and that they want to pass you. So this is kind of the cat and mouse game that goes out on our roadways. Drivers are emotional. Also, drivers, road users, police and criticize other road users and I am very guilty of this. <laughs> More than once or twice I say to other drivers when I'm driving my car and I'm behind them and they're driving too slow, did you get your license out of a Cracker Jack box? Can we find the accelerator? Do we know how to get it going? And I'll tell you, we have a street here, 27th Ave through town, that we call it 27 on 27th. 27 kilometers an hour, which is 20 miles an hour on 27th Ave. This is what people are doing on this street. And I just don't know what it is that people cannot do the speed limit of 30 miles an hour on that roadway. Crowding, honking, the finger, road rage, people are going to express their discontent with your ability to drive or not drive in the eyes of other drivers who are participating in social driving. Top three reasons for crashes, following too close, failing to give way in the mismanagement of speed and space. I'm right, you're wrong. It's the other person on the roadway that needs to change. It's the other person that needs to upgrade his or her skills. And this is the other thing about driving is, is that people have a very low level of skill when it comes to driving. Most of their experience is experiential. They don't have to take courses to upgrade. They don't have to take courses to improve their skills. There's no requirement to retest for licensing. If you do get a speeding ticket, in the state of California and some other states, you have to take a defensive driving course, but I've seen those advertisements for the different dr defensive driving courses that are offered for people that have got speeding tickets. Uh, there is a wide range of <laughs> quality of those courses. All right, so good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Today, we're talking about social driving, those problems that lead to car crashes. And the top three reasons for car crashes are failing to give way, following too close, and the mismanagement of speed and space. In other words, observation, failing to keep space around your vehicle because 
if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. Elevators fan is here. Hello, hope you're feeling better. Sean is tuning in from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Rawson is here. Uh, skilled driver, awesome. That's great. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> most people in the world would agree with the statement, I am a good driver. And uh, that's not always the case. Uh, we're all gonna make mistakes. And this is the reason we put in skills and techniques, habits, that are gonna keep us safe when other drivers make mistakes and when we too make mistakes because we're gonna be distracted, we're going to be inebriated, we're going to be tired, we're gonna be doing all kinds of things when we're driving that are gonna cause us to make mistakes. And the video of me distracted driving a couple of weeks back, I put up a short to show you that you need to keep space in front to have that buffer of space in case something does go wrong. I was distracted by a woman on the sidewalk skateboarding and uh, next thing the traffic in front of me had come to a stop and I had put in all the checks. I had looked far down the road, you know, as far as I could see. I looked to see what was going on. Uh, the lights were green, there was no congestion, there was a bottleneck in front of me, but still the traffic came to a stop for unknown reasons. And I looked up and it was uh, one of those heart pounding moments of nailing the brakes on, bringing the vehicle to a stop. And fortunately I had enough space in front of me that I did in fact get the vehicle to a stop. So keeping space in front, talking about social driving, the problems of social driving. And the reason I call it social driving is because driving is a social activity. We have to get along with other people when we're driving. Unfortunately, Everybody who's driving on the roadways is following too close, driving too fast, and thinking that they have the right of way. It's not me that is the problem. It's everybody else that's the problem. Shell, uh, Cheryl, here in the Carolinas, most of the people don't signal and just cut you off switching lanes. Yes, they do, and that is one of the problems of social driving. There's many, many problems within the under the umbrella of social driving, and that is just one of them, Cheryl. And we'll talk about the other ways the traffic communicates their intent because as you said other drivers don't signal when they change directions of their vehicle uh, elevator fan i'm back to full strength again i have been uh, seizure free for over 48 hours that's great to hear my friend uh, Corey's put up the video on how to prevent rear-ending another vehicle and that's the short of me getting distracted when i'm driving and bringing the vehicle to a stop unfortunately <laughs> the dash cam doesn't capture that heart stopping moment of when you get the vehicle to a stop. Uh, so, but there it is for, for what it's worth. Talking about social driving, some of the problems of social driving are following too close, speeding, not coming to a complete stop at stop sign intersections, as Cheryl just said, not signaling, and that's part and parcel of people driving. Uh, remember, signals are to tell other people that you wish to move over, not that you are going to move over. <laughs> because for most people, when they signal, it's simply a courtesy flash of one, maybe two flashes, and they're already in the other lane before they start to signal. So it's just like, hey, you know, I moved over. I'm gonna just gonna tell you that I did that, in fact. Uh, when there are other signs, uh, other landmarks that are going to tell you that, no, that's not the word I'm looking for. Other characteristics, other things that you're looking for in traffic. So for example, the other vehicle is slowing down, they're looking, you can see the driver in the back of the car turning their head, uh, they're hugging the one side of the lane, all of that are indicators that they are going to change lanes to the other lane. So social driving, most drivers are going to agree with the statement, I am a good driver, all right? Uh, the issue with driving getting a driver's license is that you have to keep space around your vehicle. There are two ways out of an emergency situation. One is braking, the other is steering out of the emergency situation. If you're going to steer out of an emergency situation, you have to have space in which to drive. Therefore, you have to keep space around your vehicle. Minimum two to three second following distance and stopping in traffic one vehicle length back. If you have space, you have time. Space buys you time, time buys you options. Options prevent crashes. This is what you're trying to do when you're driving because the saying is, if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. So the way that we do it here is uh, elevator fan. I have seen drivers fail to signal in Indiana. Drivers charge lanes immediately after signaling on the interstate where I drive. Yes, they do. And that is not just there in the state of Indiana, elevator fan. That is everywhere that if drivers change lanes 
they're already halfway over before they're signaling. So you need to look for the other cues that are going to give you the information that they are in fact changing lanes. So for example, they're looking, you can see the driver moving their head in back through the back window of the vehicle. They're moving to one side of the lane. So for example, if they're going to change lanes from left to right, they're going to be hugging the right side of the lane and then they're going to be looking and they're going to move over. Same issue when I was teaching truck driving and this happened on more than one occasion when you know after three or four lessons we'd be driving through town and in preparation for a turn I would say to the driver okay move to the left lane because they would be inevitably driving in the right lane and I would say move to the right lane and I'd be waiting and waiting and two or three blocks would go by and then I'd say change lanes to the we're going to turn left up here change lanes and they'd be like oh nobody's going nobody's letting me in nobody's letting me in and i'd say well try turning your signal on <laughs> and then they would turn their signal on and then they would start to move over and of course i would be somewhat sarcastic and saying it's magic magic oh my god look at that you turned your signal on and people moved and allowed you to get into the other lane it's like it's like magic it's like parting of the seas it's like moses oh my god and you know it works people tell me that all the time and then of course i'll get smart drivers on the channel who come back and say to me if i turn my signal on and i try to change lanes people speed up and pass me if they speed up and pass you they're doing you a favor they are getting out of your way uh so that you have space to merge into the other lane that's what you need that's what you need right you need space you need them to move for you so when you change lanes and you're signaling three flashes minimum in the signal first signal gets their attention second signal allows the other driver to locate you and then the third signal allows them to take some sort of evasive action and create space for you either speed up or move back right so you want three flashes minimum on the signal before you move over okay that's what you need to do close uh, in india they drive uh, on the correct side of the road left but running red lights all the time space time options with the options you have chance to prevent collisions yes uh, Skinner, would you say driving is more about patience or skill? Uh, it's a little bit, it's a combination of both. It's both about patience, which I would say more is more about your attitude, right? Create that space because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. And then skill techniques, your ability to go against what everybody else on the roadway is doing and keep that two to three second following distance in front of your vehicle and stopping and traffic one vehicle length back from the vehicle in front of you. That's what you need to do for driving and having the techniques and skills as well. Driving is about creating the habits that are going to keep you safe. Applying the parking brake every time you park the vehicle, for example. That way you don't have to think about it. You just put the parking brake on every time you park the vehicle. You don't have to think whether it's uphill or downhill. It's the same thing as every time you change directions of the vehicle. Signal, shoulder check, right? And I've been teaching some of this and I've been thinking about it and I'm watching and monitoring my own driving and there are times that I don't signal. There, aren't, there isn't a car behind me. There's only one option of where I'm turning. So these things happen, it's a reality. So I've been thinking about this question about why people don't signal when they're driving, right? There has been, I did watch a, a video here a couple of weeks back where they're saying that people are, don't signal because they're being passive aggressive when they're driving. You know, there might be some merit to that. There might, you know, be some validity to the fact with uh, other drivers. <laughs> thinking that, oh, it's a secret. I'm not going to tell people what I'm doing or where I'm going, those types of things. So, all right, uh, a few comments here. Cheryl, I wanted to add commercial to my driving insurance. Unfortunately, with my new driver, I was quoted over $600 highway robbery. Uh, commercial to, I, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by commercial insurance, uh, Cheryl. Okay, uh, commercial coverage to my car insurance for ride share or uh, gig work. My 16 year old just got his license. Oh, okay, I see what you're talking about, Cheryl. So you wanna do some work with your vehicle and those types of things. Okay, so commercial stuff. Uh, BMW drivers, yes, we had a question about that on the community tab this week about whether uh, BMW, BMW drivers are the, the Karens. <laughs> driving and also you know there was a definition there from wikipedia about what is the definition of a karen and uh also you know not signaling 
incites road rage and we've been talking about this for the past few weeks we've been talking about managing space keeping space around your vehicle uh, it's going to protect you in the event that you get distracted when you're driving and it's going to protect you against road rage because if you're not near anybody else it's less likely that they're going to lose their proverbial crap on you right uh, look at the movie with Clive Owen called shoot him up <laughs> the BMW driver, we've been talking about BMW drivers and asking if they're the Karens of driving, uh, doesn't signal in the movie and Clive Owen's character runs him off the road. So not signaling, lane changes, if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to get into a crash. It's less likely that other drivers can engage in road rage incidents. And this is what you want to do is try and reduce your incidence of road rage, reduce your uh, blood pressure. You want to protect yourself in the event of distraction. So going back to habits, it's the habit of keeping that two to three second following distance in front of your vehicle. It's the habit of stopping back one vehicle length from the vehicle in front of you. It's the habit of shoulder checking every time you change directions of your vehicle. It's the habit of signaling every time you change directions of the vehicle, not the roadway changing directions, right? You changing directions to keep yourself safe because we come back to driving is a social activity. We participate in the arena of social driving. We need to get along with other people. We need to communicate effectively and we need to observe what other people are telling us when they're driving and respond accordingly because we don't want to be reactionary and retaliatory with other drivers. We don't want to be so close that we have to re react. We don't want to hope on a wing and a prayer that we're going to react, okay? Boxers, for example, martial artists, they don't react right somebody does something and yes it's defensive on what they're doing but they have a technique and a skill and a habit they have trained and put in place that they do something that automatically counters what the other person is doing we do this all the time in jujitsu uh, as you know i train jujitsu okay if this person does this we want this response and if we get this response, this is what we move forward with. It's the same thing with driving. If somebody does this, we're going to respond with this technique and this skill. And that's what you want to do to keep yourself safe when you're driving and practice these habits and skills so you don't have to think about it. You just do it. Uh, Marion, it meant that when my husband had to change lanes that he put his signal on that usually someone will open the gap for him to change lanes. Yes, they will. Uh, it's like magic. You turn your signal on and other people will help you out. And uh, I get people all the time. I had a smart driver the other day tell me that if you left that much space in Chicago, that other people would just cut in and they take all the space and you wouldn't get anywhere. Maybe. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe this summer, depending on what happens here in the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, I might get down to Chicago and I may be able to uh, do that and prove that the smarter defensive driving model does work because it works in Australia, it works in Sydney, Australia, it worked in uh, Melbourne and uh, <laughs> it worked in Europe, Barcelona, in uh, Madrid and it worked here in Vancouver, it works in Toronto, Ontario, Canada so it works, I know it works because I do it everywhere. Uh, Marion said he never believed it. Yes, and Marion, that's part of social driving is, is that many people, many drivers believe that. They do not believe that if you turn your signal on, other people will help you out. People make mistakes when they're driving. There's absolutely no doubt. However, most people are not malicious. If you ask nicely, they will do something for you. And it's the same thing. I talked about this uh, two weeks ago, I believe, about the crosswalk. We have a crosswalk up here to and from where I go to train jujitsu. And if it's dusk or it's dark uh, and you come up there and you're heading north and there are pedestrians standing on the east side of that crosswalk, you cannot see those pedestrians. It's just where, the, where it's located. And I myself have blown through that crosswalk with pedestrians standing there. So this is a message to all pedestrians and all vulnerable road users. Do not go out, do not trust, do not hope on a wing and a prayer that cars are gonna stop for you, okay? Make sure, triple, double check that cars are gonna stop for you before you step out. Because it's not that they don't see you and they are being malicious and they're like, oh, screw you. It's not that kind of thing. It's the fact that sometimes the car driver simply hasn't seen you, okay? 
So use your signals, other drivers will help you out. Gunnafo, uh, definitely would not claim to be a good driver. My problem is I have a lot of driving anxiety, especially with so much information to process and I get overwhelmed. Okay, are you working towards your license right now or do you have your license? Uh, Corey, what's your overall take on India's perhaps less than ideal driving culture? Uh, it is a social mentality thing, a lack of enforcement of rules, both. Uh, Corey, I think it's a lot of things. Uh, it's the fact that they don't have... First and foremost, they're a country that has not grown up with a motor car. Okay, the motor car has been adapted to old cities, old imperial cities that did not grow up with a motor car. So an example of a city that grew up with a motor car and has freeways and big roads and can accommodate high rates of speed is Los Angeles. That is the pinnacle of a city that grew up with the car. Okay, Mumbai, Mumbai is in India, I think. <laughs> Delhi, I know Delhi is in India. Uh, Delhi is not a city that grew up with the motor car. It was a, the, the city adapted and had some sort of mutation to grow up with the car. And I think that just because of the sheer volume of traffic and the sheer mix of vehicles that are vying for road space in Delhi, it makes it very difficult to enforce any sense of rules uh, you know, not to mention the the state of the police and how much work police are putting in. Also, it has to do with culture. <laughs> Enormous amounts of culture uh, affect traffic and traffic movement within cities. And cows are sacred in India. And I've heard more than a few stories about traffic being backed up for days on end because there is a cow standing in an intersection. Now, I don't know how relevant that is to large cities in India, but definitely out in rural areas. Uh, I have heard those stories numerous times. I don't know, I haven't, I don't have any, um, I haven't verified those stories, but the stories do exist and permeate through that this has happened. So this is also part of their culture. So, you know, I don't know. It's the same thing with China. I don't know how you fix that traffic problem. I don't know how you bring an infrastructure in so that you can begin to impose social order on that volume of traffic. All right. Uh, elevator fan, there is highway, one highway in Indiana that has no clusters. <laughs> uh, elevator fan, I would find that surprising. There's probably very few vehicles on that road as well. Uh, Skinner, on top of distractions, yes. Uh, Corey put up the video on uh, reducing fear and anxiety, and that'll help you out. Uh, gonna fill with your anxiety. I don't know whether, like I said, I asked you about your driver's license test. If you've taken your license, you have it already or not. Uh, Marion, okay, so your husband never believed that if you turned your signal on, it would create space in the traffic. Yeah, a lot of people don't believe that. Uh, and as I said, all the drivers that I was teaching in the truck driving school were retraining. They were upgrading. They already had a license and they didn't believe me either <laughs> until I showed them that it actually worked. Uh, Cheryl, my car is a 2021 with all the new alerts. I find myself screaming at my child to check the mirrors and shoulder check. He tries to rely on the car. And yes, Cheryl, just tell him that uh, when he doesn't shoulder check and he doesn't look, he just failed his driver's test. That's the best way to get their attention because if they start relying on all of the sensors in the vehicle, they're not gonna be successful on their driver's test. And you definitely cannot use a backup camera on your driver's test, okay? You can look at it, you can glance at it, but you need to be looking out through the back window when you're reversing for the purposes of a driver's test. Uh, you know, mirrors, convex mirrors, and those types of things. And this is the other rebuttal that I get when Smart drivers come back to me and say, well, my car has convex mirrors. My car has uh, blind spot detectors. I don't have to look. I don't have to shoulder check, right? It's just a backup. You would never build a house with hammer, nails, and some wood. <laughs> you would use all your tools, right? You would use your square, and you'd use your level, and you would use your string, and your laser levels, and those types of things, and every other tool that we have to build a house. It's the same thing with driving. Why would you rely on just one tool? Use all your tools to keep yourself safe and have a complete awareness 
of traffic around your vehicle to back up safely. The number of people when I'm walking through parking lots who I can see them, I'm looking at them in the car because that's what I do, that's my living, that's what I'm fascinated by is the actions of other people when they're driving and they're just looking at their backup camera when they're reversing. They're not, there's no 360 degree awareness around their vehicles, especially when they're in a grocery store parking lot and there's families with their children walking through the parking lot. All right, it's just craziness is the way that I see it. Uh, what do you recommend for people uh, for driving school? What are warning signs for schools? Uh, Gonafo, uh driving schools. If you have anxiety about driving schools and you have anxiety about learning to drive, excuse me, uh, I would suggest go to a driving school and ask for an instructor that has worked with seniors. They tend to be much better at explaining things. They have better patience. They have better uh, pedagogy. There's your word for the day, how we teach, right? My pedagogy, the way that I teach students how to drive is different from other people. Most driving instructors, they're just gonna take you out on the roadway and they're just gonna drive up and down the road. Me, I'm gonna take you into a parking lot. I'm gonna get you to do driving forward, driving backwards, backing into parking spots, driving around in circles, forward figure eights, reverse figure eights. I am going to get you to figure out where your vehicle is in space and place. In other words, where your vehicle is in relation to other things on the roadway. And I'm going to get you to have, I'm going to teach you by doing these slow speed maneuvers, mastery of the primary controls, the steering wheel, accelerator and the brake so you need to have mastery of those three things before we go out on the roadway okay unless of course you know Ariel, who uh, has videos here on the channel i taught her how to drive she came to me with driving experience she'd already driven the car she was on the logging roads with her dad and was driving the car and those types of things same thing with my daughter my daughter's going to be 15 in the fall and this summer when i'm home with my mom and i have time I'm going to go over to my brother's, he has a farm, and she, I'm going to teach her how to drive, okay? She's going to start learning how to drive this year. So by the time that she comes to actual driving and taking a driving test, she'll already have been driving for a good 18 months uh, before she gets to actually getting her license. Uh, Marion, does the lady from Nova Scotia watch the morning live stream? I can't remember her name, sorry. Oh, Mallory, yes, Mallory was here this morning. Marion, uh, I don't know whether she's been feeling well the last little while or not, but she said she was good this morning. She was here and she said it's really hot in the east down in the Maritimes there. <laughs> so yes, uh, Skinner's just seeing if you're clear, like when you slow down at the light, the traffic light and stuff. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Cheryl, unfortunately, he just got his license last month on his first try. Okay, Cheryl. Well, uh, the unfortunate part, hopefully, Cheryl, I might suggest you send him for a defensive driving course. At least, uh, Corey will put up the video for you on defensive driving for beginner drivers. Maybe get him to watch that. Uh, it's tough with boys. They tend to be more aggressive. I mean, statistics show that, and they tend to be more risk takers when it comes to driving, and I'm hoping that you're okay uh, in terms of your car and whatnot. I don't mean to spook you, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's unfortunate that he's already relying on technology in the car. Uh, Carrie, hello, my friend. Uh, stopped at a crosswalk, not at an intersection and on the other side of the car. Three cars just zipped on through as the pedestrian is standing in front of my car. Frustrating situation. Yes, uh, unfortunately, that happens a lot. And uh, as I said, sometimes it's not malicious. Sometimes it is, but most of the time, it's simply the fact that they didn't see them. And as I said... As a pedestrian, as somebody who walks a lot, you know, watching traffic and those types of things, I do not trust drivers that they're going to come to a stop. And I don't step out in front of them until they actually absolutely come to a stop. And, you know, if I have the least bit of doubt, I'll just tell them to go and then I'll wait until they go and then I'll go after them. Uh, Klaus, well, in Germany, few BMW drivers are sometimes driving like a video game. A dash cam is a good thing to have. Yes, it is. Okay, and we'll just caution you. There is a video here on getting a dash cam. Corey will put that up for you. And we do suggest to keep in mind that if you do get a dash cam, and they're inexpensive, they will help you. No doubt about it. But just remember, dash cams watch you and watch other people. So uh, that might be something that you might consider as well, Cheryl, to put in your vehicle is to put a dash cam in your car. And then just go through the, if you have any concerns about your son, 
Uh, just go through the dash cam footage and see what he's doing. If he's being goofy on left-hand turns, because that's the place that new drivers <coughs> often get into trouble is on left-hand turns because there's so much going on. Watching the traffic light, watching the oncoming traffic, and then you got to watch the pedestrians on the cross street as well. So there's three things going on there. That's all kind of takes a you know an intense amount of. Uh, concentration when you're sitting there making left-hand turns and making left-hand turns safely. Uh, Cheryl, he also had a young child run out in front of the car while taking the driving test. The instructor commended him for coming to a complete stop. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so there might be Cheryl uh, that he's had some good success up to this juncture that unfortunately there may be some overconfidence in his ability to drive because there's no doubt about it young people have good reactions so long as they're paying attention it's when they're not paying attention or they're doing something goofy that can get them into trouble so but i digress i don't know your son i don't know the way he drives i'm sure that it's going to be just great you're going to put a camera in the car awesome elevator fan uh people always wait in the intersection when waiting to turn left i am one of them uh do not recommend that elevator fan i always recommend that you stay back at the edge of the intersection so your front tires on the front crosswalk line that's your landmark and the reason that i advocate that is because you are not moving any more traffic through the intersection this is a myth of driving that people think that they got to move into the intersection the thing is if something happens you're in it okay and the other piece about it is if you wait at the intersection you watch the traffic coming forward you see the gap behind the car when it hits the crosswalk on the other side, you drive straight into the intersection and you reduce the amount of time that it takes you to move through the intersection because you have some speed as you're moving straight through the intersection. So this is why. As well, the other piece of that is the reason that I advocate that you stay back at the edge of the intersection is you're keeping obstacles and hazards in front of you. We don't want them in our flanks. If you're out in the intersection and there are there's traffic, pedestrians on the cross street, e-scooters, those types of things. Now you have to shoulder check before you turn to make sure that that cross street is clear before you proceed. Whereas if you stay back at the intersect, the edge of the intersection here, you can keep hazards and obstructions in front of your vehicle. It's a basic military technique. If two armies are fighting each other, the basic military tactic is to outflank the other army. And by outflanking the other army, you get to their sides. Your flanks on your car are your blind areas. It's where you have to shoulder check. And if you can keep hazards and obstructions in front of you, you're going to be a safer, smarter driver and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Klaus, uh, have a dash cam in my car already. Maybe in 10 or 15 years, the car will drive you, not the driver, not... Uh, what's your thoughts about that? Self-driving cars. Yeah, we can talk about self-driving cars for sure, Klaus. Uh, Skinner, when is the only time you should be in the intersection? Uh, Skinner, the only time you should be in an intersection is when you're moving through the intersection and are going to clear the intersection. I do not advocate you sitting in the intersection. Unless it is stupid, congested, busy then yes, maybe sit in the intersection because you have to push your way through. But that doesn't happen very often. It's kind of like the same saying, how, how often do you drive in deep snow? Not very often, not very often. So it's the same thing on a left-hand turn. Self-driving cars. Uh, Klaus, I am not convinced that we will have self-driving cars for the next century, at minimum. Unless we have some incredibly earth-shattering breakthrough technology we are not going to have uh, we will not see self-driving cars in this century and actually i made a video like six years ago when there was all this hoopla about self-driving cars and elon musk was saying by 2020 we will have self-driving cars well we're 2024 and i haven't seen any self-driving cars and the only self-driving cars that were you know all the rage the publicity on those has gone it's it's a it's a non-issue anymore we do not have self-driving cars the same thing it's the same phenomena as with electric cars electric cars have gone the way of the unicorn the dodo bird and every other time that we have tried to have electric cars take over as an alternative fuel source it is simply not going to happen it's not going to happen okay it's the same thing with self-driving cars 
in this century cars are not going to drive themselves okay there are simply too many vehicles on the road uh, that are petrol have far too many advantages i mean you get an electric car uh, for example i have friends that have a four-year-old electric car it's a nissan leaf uh, they get a range of 100 kilometers out of a full charge on that car it goes to Kelowna and back that's it on a full charge I mean really come on <laughs> who's got that kind of time to sit around charging their vehicles uh, the main thing you need to do is watch everybody else because they are not watching you I've avoided two wrecks with a school bus because people didn't pay attention to the big yellow school bus yes they don't absolutely uh, Brian I really like your videos although I'm an experienced driver I still watch your videos to learn and be reminded on what to do uh, one question what products do you use to keep your windshield clean okay excellent uh, you most of the time Brian when I'm cleaning the windshield on the car I just use a half and half water and vinegar solution if like if I'm actually cleaning it with paper towel and uh, spray or you can just use Windex now a windshield washer fluid I just put winter rated washer fluid in my car in the windshield washer squirter thing all the time because that way when winter comes I don't have to try and remember whether I put summer windshield washer fluid or that in it now if you're in a place like Louisiana or Tennessee where they get a lot of bugs on your windshield then yes you're gonna have to put the summer windshield washer fluid in your vehicle to get rid of the bugs because the win the winter windshield washer fluid will not clean off the bugs if you're driving in a place Seattle Washington where you get a lot of rain then you may want to put rain x in your windshield washer fluid squirter thingy uh, it helps the, the water to sheet off the windshield as well you can get rain x where you apply it to the windshield and that will help to keep it clear as well so those are some solutions maybe some of the other smart drivers uh, watching now on the live stream or watching on the replay can come up with some other ideas to clean their windshield what they do to keep it clean and those types of things but generally like i said just paper towel and a half and a half water and vinegar solution is all i use to clean the glass in my windshield uh, rain x uh, windshield washer fluid uh, winter washer fluid we don't have many bugs here where i live in the interior of british columbia so i just put winter washer fluid in all the time but i have driven in the states and there are uh, places there where you get a lot of bugs <laughs> lots and lots of bugs on your windshield and you will have to use the summer windshield washer fluid to be able to keep your windscreen clean and then of course there are times if it gets too dirty and you cannot see you're going to have to go into a fuel station and use the squeegees in there to get it clean and really do a good job of working uh, all the crap off your windshield to be able to <clears throat> observe correctly excuse me epic another thing to consider if you are a on a motorcycle or cyclist is that your fellow motorists will press you to move on to the main road uh, this might not create a safe gap remember if you're riding a bicycle you're riding a motorcycle there are no fender benders on a motorcycle or a bicycle you have to ride to keep yourself safe at all times all drivers have bad luck when it comes to driving <laughs> all drivers are going to make mistakes when they're driving that's for sure uh cheryl cleaner uh stoner's invisible glass cleaner is good okay i'll keep that in mind i don't think i've ever seen that product but uh now that i've seen it it's kind of a memorable name stoner's invisible glass cleaner <laughs> i love it i love it uh jordan uh, jordan jorgen says he loves rain x yes uh epic another thing to consider which i forgot to mention in the afternoon stream is that when you are on a bicycle there will be impatient drivers making their right turns from shoulder yes and right turns and be careful years ago when i was riding my bicycle i went through an intersection and immediately after the intersection a woman she was pregnant went past me and then turned right right in front of me and i went up the side of the car and i came down i ripped the mirror off of my shoulder she was very apologetic and felt very bad about it uh you know i damaged the bicycle i needed to get a new rim and a new wheel for the front of my bicycle uh the interesting part about that and i was still in my 20s at the time it was the first time ever that i wore a helmet i had a friend buy me a bicycle helmet it was the first time i ever wore a bicycle helmet and the first time i wear a bicycle helmet i get hit by a car making a right hand turn in front of me so yes be very careful if you're coming up someplace 
and there's a car and it's zooming beside you and it's got its light on and I have had drivers do this to me when I'm riding my bicycle, they'll zoom up beside me and then they'll stop because they see me at the last second. And I'm just like, I just stop and I just tell them to go. And as I'm saying to themselves, go and have your crash somewhere else because people just drive me crazy uh, when they do that. Because as I said, I've been hit by drivers making right hand turns in front of me and I, it's not, a, not something you want to happen. Uh, Carrie, Bugs Be Gone by Seafoam is also good. Awesome. <coughs> Excellent. So thank you for that. Uh, Stoner's Invisible Glass Cleaner and uh, Bugs Be Gone by Seafoam. Those are two cleaners that you can use to clean the glass on your vehicles. Uh, the other piece that really works well, uh, as I've talked about this before, I use Meguiar's Car Wash Soap. And one of the things that I do after I clean my vehicle, I chamois it, okay? So you wash it and then you chamois it. So it gets all the water spots out and you don't get uh, water spots on your vehicle. Uh, it does an excellent job of cleaning the glass on your vehicle as well. The chamois will just really make the glass really nice and the mirrors as well. So that's the other thing you can do to keep the glass clear on your vehicle. Uh, Cheryl, Meguiar's Hybrid Ceramic Detailer is great to clean off your car and windows between your maintenance wash. Yes, excellent. Yeah, Meguiar's has a lot of good cleaning products and detailing products to really keep your vehicle nice and clean. And I mean, it's summertime. We want our vehicles to look awesome, right? And I just bought my mom a van. My brother wanted a Pontiac, so that, you know, Pontiac Montana. My mom loves minivans. I got a really smoking deal on a Pontiac Montana. It's only got 124,000 kilometers on it, which is like 80,000 miles on it, which is crazy for a 2006. Uh, it's the Sport Edition, and it just needs a really good detail. It needs like, you know, a full day of work, you know, to wax and clean the inside and shampoo the carpets and that types of things. But it's just in really good nick, and I'm really super excited. My mom's just going to be so happy that, you know, got a nice vehicle for her. So looking forward to giving her that in the summertime. Uh, Klaus, uh, Elon lowered the price uh, prices of the cars. We have not many bugs in Bavaria, but here in Meckel... Vorpommen, excuse my pronunciation of that, it's really terrible, there are more, and I clean the windshield by hand, yes, and that's going to help you out. Uh, cool vehicle, yes, it's a nice vehicle, it's a, it's the sport model, and it has a DVD player in it, all the seats have armrests, you know, it's very comfy, very cruisy, so I'll do a few things for it and make sure it's nice and clean for my mom, which is going to be great. We bought her a van a few years ago, three years ago I think we bought her another vehicle, a van, but uh, it's getting pretty old and uh, my brother had to do a few things to the frame and whatnot. So this, this is a better vehicle. So, uh, Guanifo, uh, anxious driving. I have my license, actually got it almost a decade ago, but I rarely drive due to the anxiety. But uh, okay, so you already have your license, so that's gonna make it a lot easier. The other thing you can do to try and reduce some of your anxiety is to go maybe get a, do some lessons with a driving instructor, go to a school, hire a driving instructor, ask if the driving instructor has experience with seniors. They tend to be really good with people who have anxiety and teaching them to drive. And the other piece about it is uh, you can help them with going with a mentor, somebody that's going to help you out and can give you some advice and maybe some feedback while you're driving. You know, maybe try this, try that. The other piece about it is, is, you know, create a mantra while you're driving. Breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. That's going to help your body relax. And the mantra is, I am a good driver. I am driving safe. Just say that to yourself over and over again. And that will reprogram the tapes in your head to keep yourself safe when you're driving and help you to reduce some of that anxiety that you're feeling when you're driving. Uh, do I have a picture of my mom's van? No, but I'll get a picture and I'll put it up on the community tab and I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, Klaus, sorry, Pontiac, uh, quality GMC, quality isn't the best, I think. Uh, Klaus... The reason I got Pontiac, I wouldn't necessarily buy a Pontiac for myself. My brother is a huge Pontiac fan, huge Pontiac Trans Am fan. He has a 1978 Pontiac Trans Am that he has restored. My brother builds hot rods from the ground up, and we're talking no expenses spared. These are absolutely beautiful cars. My brother is an idiot savant when it comes to building cars. He just has an incredible gift for it. And uh, so Pontiac Trans Ams, if you want to build a Pontiac Trans Am, you go and see my brother. 
And so he wanted a Pontiac and my mom wanted a minivan. So it was the best of both worlds because my mom and my brother live close together and uh, he has a shop and he will do the work on my mom's van. So he'll do it, you know, all the stuff that he needs to do on it. Cheryl, Meyers Gold Classic Car Wash. Yes, that is what I use, Cheryl. That is what I recommend to other people. And I'm not being sponsored by Meguiar's, but that is what I recommend for cleaning your vehicle. Uh, Quality, okay, Mary and my mantra for driving is relax, you've got this. I have a sticker next to the starter button and that is awesome, Marion. That that's that's great. That is what uh, you need to do. And you know, relax, you got this. That's awesome. I'm I'm so happy to hear that. That is really great because yes, you can do that. Uh, yeah, Klaus, uh, wouldn't be my first choice for a vehicle. I'm a Honda. And then of course I had somebody come on the community tab and say that they thought Honda drivers were the Karens of driving, which I thought was kind of funny. So maybe I am, but uh, we'll see for sure. Excellent. Uh, so really great live stream. If you have any questions about passing your driver's test, uh, need any information, leave a comment down in the comment section and we'll definitely help you out. Uh, so social driving, that's what we've been talking about today. The way that people drive after they get their license. The top three reasons for traffic crashes, failing to give the right of way, I'm right, you're wrong, it's not me that needs to change, it's the other person, when the reality is that most people who are driving on the roadways have a very basic level of driving skill and ability. Most of what they have learned about driving is experiential. They have never taken any professional development courses, they've never taken any upgrading courses, but yet, they think that they know how to drive and they follow too close. They're reactionary and retaliatory. This is what social driving is. And when we put in place the skills and habits of defensive driving, that is going to compensate for when we make mistakes and when other people make mistakes when we're driving because we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna get distracted, we're gonna get emotional, we're going to police other drivers, we're going to get upset, we're just not gonna be in the mood to be paying attention when we're driving. This is why we need to create habits and skills that will keep us safe when we make mistakes and when other people make mistakes in the arena of driving because this is going to happen. Expecting somebody else not to do something goofy on the roadway is like going to watch your favorite sports team and expecting the other team not to score. It's simply not a reality of driving. It's not a matter of if somebody's going to do something goofy on the roadway, it's a matter of when, okay? Create that habit of keeping that two to three second following distance in front of your vehicle. Create that space of stopping back in traffic one vehicle length. That will protect you because space buys you time. Time buys you options. Options prevent crashes. If you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something, right? Keep space. Chances of getting involved in a crash are going to be reduced significantly. Uh, Klaus, my next car won't be a Volkswagen anymore. The Volkswagen nowadays are simple matchbox autos. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Marion, thank you for the wonderful live stream. You are most welcome, my friend. Uh, on the bus about driving, excellent. Gorgon, that is great. And yes, help people out as much as we can and give them skills and abilities to be safer, smarter drivers and create those habits, right? Signal, shoulder check every time you change directions of the vehicle. Put, apply the parking brake every time you uh, park the vehicle so it's there when you come back. It hasn't rolled away and crashed into a, a tree and exploded in a fiery inferno. Shoulder checking, uh, signaling every time you change direction, stopping back in traffic one vehicle length. We know that in a 30, 40 year driving career, people are going to crash three or four times. So which means they're only going to crash every 15 to 17 years, right? And people that say, I'm a good driver because I've never had a crash. I've been driving for 20 years. That is a very low benchmark. And as Tim said this morning, and I love this, his former boss used to say, well, that's a very long time that people have managed to stay away from you. Love that. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> All right? and it's, it's inductive reasoning. It doesn't work. It's not a reason. It's not a reason to believe that you are a good driver. But habits and skills about defensive driving may not save your bacon today, tomorrow, keep you out of a crash in five years, but maybe in seven years, eight years, this is going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. So put those defensive driving skills in place 
create those habits and you will become a safer, smarter driver. And if you're on the live stream, if you're watching any videos on the Smart Drive Test channel, you are already on the road to becoming a safer, smarter driver. If you have any questions, leave a comment down in the comment section, hit that thumbs up button, all of that helps us out. You had a driver's test in the last couple of weeks and passed. Congratulations, that is awesome news. If you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that and remember, Pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.